Hello everyone, I'm Nathan Rich, an American living in China. You should have already watched the production episode, in which I discussed the overall format of this series, my motivations for creating it, and some notes about terminology. If you haven't watched it, please do so first and come back to this video. Otherwise, we shall have gotten off on the wrong foot already. For those of you who have already seen it, we begin. China. The country today invokes so many ideas in people's heads. It's known as one of the richest and most powerful nations in the world. But it wasn't always powerful. It wasn't always rich either. In fact, it wasn't even always a nation, not a unified one anyway. But before we can talk about that, let's get into a little bit about who Chinese people were in the past. Welcome to Epic China. This is the fastest paced episode in the main series, in which I will glibly skim over thousands of years of Chinese history. We're going to focus on a few things that will come in handy later, and some that won't. We have absolutely no chance to do justice to China's great history, for doing so would require a series longer than the time remaining in my life or yours. Still, we do need to know a few basic things about the Chinese. This episode, as I mentioned, will recklessly fly past all the most interesting details of the past. This episode and the next will be a different format than the rest. For the time being, we don't mind missing out on those ancient stories. We are instead focused on getting through it as quickly and efficiently as possible. Our story doesn't truly begin for another couple episodes. But first, we must know, what is China? From nearly the beginning of time, it seems, China was ruled by emperors, and before that, what you might call proto-emperors, all powerful at times, tangled in struggles for that power in other times. Emperors served the people right, some of the time. When they didn't, problems arose. You see, when we talk about emperors ruling China, it's a bit misleading. There has always been a balance of power between the working class and the ruling class. Sometimes those classes were near each other. Other times, there were layers upon layers of people dividing them. Traders, landlords, peasants, royalty. There were sometimes hundreds of classes to speak of. The tales of these people and their legacies went on to lay the groundwork in thought. They laid the foundation for the China we find today. But first, long before China had a name, there was only people and land. An area in fertile East Asia became the bedrock of China in ancient times. 4,000, 5,000 years ago is what you often hear, but already the mainstream understanding is misleading. While Chinese civilization proper could be considered that old, in reality we know people were drawing symbols reminiscent of Chinese characters much, much earlier than that. Take a look at this image. It's from four or 5,000 years ago. But take a look at this one. The bottom image looks surprisingly similar to the Chinese character Ru, meaning the sun. It's from over 8,000 years ago, right inside the region of East Asia we now call China. That's how old the roots of China are. So sometime before that, around nine or 10,000 years ago, people formed groups which became tribes, factions, and eventually kingdoms. As states came and went, a small amount of stability created a new center. Among a constantly changing outer region, the inside became known as Zhongguo, 
That roughly meant the Middle Kingdom. Contrary to popular belief, the name didn't suggest ancient Chinese considered themselves the center of the earth or the center of Asia. And while for various periods of time some upper class Chinese did consider themselves the most elite in the world, Zhongguo was never meant to reflect that idea. It was simply in reference to the center of the kingdom itself, the heart of an ever-shifting region, a constant flux of borders and control, but the heartland created stability. Over the centuries, it became one name for all the states together. As an American, I have a certain background in cultural history that I can identify with. The expansion of people across a vast open area of North America, war with Native Americans, slavery, development, the Wild West, it's interesting to somehow identify with these things, even though no one on either side of my family was in America for nearly any of it. Somehow, the history of a nation becomes part of the culture of those who live in it, even if it technically has little to do with them. But being a Chinese person must be different, I tell myself. Because so many are indigenous, there's a long cultural cord connecting from belly buttons to ancestors' graves. I fantasize sometimes about what it must feel like to look around and realize everyone in your family and everyone in their families and theirs all the way up the line lived in one country or at least one single area. That sense of shared blood and history forms a gravity between Chinese people in my imagination. One moment, there's no attraction between strangers. But in times of crisis, despair, or desperation, the people, for better or for worse, become one. These are the types of dreams I have in the daytime. What a fascinating bond. The people were never much empowered on the whole. Nearly every single person in China in all of its history has done one thing, agricultural work. If you somehow could communicate randomly with a Chinese person throughout the past, the chances are overwhelming that you would be talking to a farmer, a worker, a peasant. Emperors knew enough to know that the people were the true power, the force of the country. They were the body of China. Look at these men. They have no names. No one knows them anymore. But they and the billions like them use the land to make food, prosperity, wealth, power. One common theme we see throughout all of China's history is rebellion and revolt, often led by one of those very same farmers. And just as often, the goal and promise was land reform. Give the land to the people, take it from the rich, and return it to the rightful owners, they said. Thousands of years before socialism or communism existed, the Chinese were pioneers in the politics of stripping property from the rich to provide for the poor. But the Chinese weren't always alone. Some of the earliest European visitors to China came around the time of the Qin Dynasty. For perspective, this was about 10 United States lifespans ago. And it's around that period foreign languages began referring to Zhongguo as however their closest way to pronounce Qin was. This image is a map from knowledge gained around that time. While it doesn't focus on China, you can clearly see that China had been reached by the West. Foreigners developed their words for China from Qin. For example, Kina, Sina, and so on. That evolved in English to be China. So technically speaking, we're actually calling their country the name of an ancient dynasty, the Qin dynasty. That dynasty, by the way, didn't even last 20 years, but managed to be extremely influential on future dynasties. Some examples of foreigners? This Greek soldier found his way to Xinjiang in West China, around the time we saw our first Western maps with China on them, around 200 BC. Here we see a Westerner and some Koreans in China before 1000. And let's not forget the legendary travels of Marco Polo, around the 13th century. This is a tombstone for an early European living in China who died in the 14th century. Foreigners came for trade, for exploration, or for conquest, like this ancient Jew trader who came in the Tang Dynasty. They even came to spread their ideology to China, but more on that later. It's important to reiterate that at almost no time in China's ancient history did it ever consider itself what we would call a country, exactly. This is a very interesting thing when you really think about it. China was a group of states held together by a central authority. States often had their own militias and local governance. Time and time again, when the central power failed, China fractured and put itself back together again, often in new shape. Land reforms, anti-corruption campaigns, and purging of the old regimes were common. And more often than not, these purges involved significant overlap and rule. That meant war, 
lots and lots of war. In addition to the problems of vastness China's rulers faced, there was another issue. It's one that many people overlook or underappreciate to this day. Often China is described as a super nation of sub-nations, but there's a real down-to-earth backbone to that. You see, there's a primary language for the people of China, and in each town or city, another language for the locals. For millennia, rulers struggled to keep these states together, a painstaking task made much more difficult by the language barrier. That has been the majority of effort of the Chinese dynasties, unification and stability as a unified, what we would call today, country. But the situation was different than Europeans experienced. This makes up the first in a very long line of fundamental differences in Chinese history from European history. We are already, as of this coming point, breaking away from the intuition of Westerners. You see, written Chinese has no alphabet, instead originally relying on imagery to convey meaning. That's quite useful in the sense of spreading the written word. It's easy for multiple tribes to understand the same image. But a downside of not having an alphabet is pronunciation is not exported with the image. You cannot spell out Chinese. If you don't know a character, you simply cannot know it without someone else telling you the meaning. And however they pronounce it is how you will think it's pronounced. In combination with the fact that the vast majority of people on Earth were uneducated throughout history, a very wide range of pronunciations evolved in China. Even though a written character might be similar or even identical, the pronunciations at hand numbered in the dozens, hundreds, or thousands. Regions developed their own dialects. Each city had their own, and then each town. Some dialects grew to languages, with more branches growing in turn. Even now, cities right next to each other often have different ways of pronouncing words in their traditional dialects. Throughout history, and here's the point, this helped maintain rifts between regions and a constant pressure against the ruling class, which usually couldn't speak the language of most people in China. Think about that. The normal, absolutely common situation in China would be that no one anywhere could actually speak to everyone. The remains of this ancient fact still live in rural China today. What an amazingly powerful problem to try to overcome. How do you rule a region or regions in which no single person can speak a language everyone else can understand? Their answer was to do it in writing. Chinese writing was used heavily over the ages. Carving turtle shells led to inventions like the paper making process or movable type. It was extremely important for leadership in China to have the ability to write. States combined and split over the generations. Ethnicities blended together, languages blended, cultures collided and blended and collided again. Chinese people found their identities in those powerful dynasties of the past and carried many traditions forward. Most empires were closely associated with the race and power. Racial tension was a major factor in conflicts as far back as we have record. An American might overly simplify the basic historical qualities of American culture as a Protestant European one. We might overly simplify the African American cultural background as one which blended that culture with African roots with reactions to a racist environment. In a similar oversimplification, we can explain the current overarching Chinese culture as the combination of ancient tradition, superstitions and beliefs, and Han Chinese identity. None of these descriptions can be accepted by all, but this one does serve to point out to my Western friends that Han Chinese dynasties have a special place in the influence of today's China. The Han are a race in China, the numerically prevalent of many races. But race wasn't the only factor in culture, not by a long shot. Religion started in China as basic beliefs in an afterlife. Later, major ideas converged into what might be best described as Chinese traditionalism. Belief in the spirits of ancestors fostered a culture in which looking backwards was encouraged. Remembering one's elders and what their lives were like has been part of Chinese culture from the early beginnings. Religion has also played a major factor in conflicts of the past. But it's this culture of looking backwards that interests me more. I never cared about history as a young man, but in speaking with Chinese people I was often quite surprised by how much he or she knew about the past. And it's this sense of looking in the rearview mirror that has kept China Chinese. This is one thing I really feel missing from my own American culture. We are often so progressive and desperate for change that we dismiss the past as all bad. This looking back is a valuable, sometimes difficult activity. 
Collectively, as a species, our pasts are quite painful, but perhaps no modern country's past as painful as China's. Certainly, none much more painful. Eventually, in the process of bringing traditions forward, gods emerged. But interestingly, while direct beliefs in those gods declined, beliefs based on those gods survived. The Chinese people have often viewed the world as having an undercurrent of causality. Some call it superstition, but I don't really agree with that characterization. It's more like a basic skeptical view. They've always had the motivations of the universe in question, and that's had many effects on the culture, one of which is the belief in the mandate of heaven. Originally based on interpretation of a deity's wishes, the belief outlived much of the faith in the deity. This is how Chinese belief systems have ultimately worked. Utility and practicality is what reigns supreme in the end. The actual deity takes a backseat to the prayers the deity can answer, and over time, each god vanished, leaving behind their most useful traditions and tenets. The mandate of heaven is a simple concept if distilled for Western minds. The rulers of China could only remain so if they pleased the gods. What pleased the gods was taking care of the people responsibly. When the rulers failed in that duty, they would inevitably be replaced through famine or plague, earthquakes, rebellions, or war. Anything and everything that could happen would happen. This concept is a crucial element of the historical Chinese psyche. Overthrowing a government or emperor could only work if the mandate of heaven was won first. This instilled an interesting necessity to many revolutions. Before an uprising, before an empire changes hands, the agitators must be sufficiently indoctrinated. They must extensively believe not only that the reigning empire has lost the mandate of heaven, but that they have gained it. And even the modern Chinese judgment of past rulers is different than I expected it to be. Some cultures in the world view the qualifications for leadership to be moral alignment. That is to say, the hope is that each leader should be a better moral person than the previous one, more polite, or more Christian, or more righteous. But Chinese people tend to reflect on leaders' performance by the standard of how good their rule was for the people. And thus, the specific morality of the ruling class has never been as important as the efficacy of their reign. An immoral tyrant who overall did good for the people is nearly always preferred over a moral nice guy who did little actual good. Some eras had formal state religions or belief systems. Taoism and Confucianism competed for influence and adoption, but it's Confucianism that overall influenced and was influenced most by Chinese culture. At the core of Confucianism is the idea that rules and rituals are necessary to correct for the degraded state of people. Strong concepts of rationality as opposed to the spiritual, more emotional Taoism. Not to say Confucianism was the only influencer, not at all, but there are very clear signs of it glaring out from Chinese culture. In Confucianism, humans are meant to respect their superiors. A son must honor absolutely his father. One of the major goals is a structured, stable society. Societal harmony, peace, rules and structure, family, groups, society, stability, collectivism over the individual. These are some Confucian messages so tightly intertwined with Chinese culture. The survival of the people is more critical than the survival of the few. Your father is more important than you are. And China is more important than he, for China contains many more fathers. The origin of this series, Epic China, begins with the end of the Yuan Dynasty. Mongolian clans united to overthrow the rich and use that power to conquer. And as we see nearly every time, the new emperor undertook land reforms, redistribution of land to the people, that and a purge of political opponents. The goal was often to undo corruption left over from the previous dynasty. Support of the people was won by their return to balance, and faith in government restored by seeing corrupt oppressors executed, exiled, or removed from post. The Yuan Dynasty was one of the oddest dynasties, certainly worth more attention than I'll give it in this series. In less than 200 years, though, incompetence and negligence in the Yuan ruling class opened vulnerabilities. Race-based persecution of Han Chinese fueled rebellions, while natural disasters and plague decimated the population. This is what it looked like to lose the mandate of heaven. The infamous Mongol Empire finally crumbled in the middle of the 14th century. In its place came the Ming Dynasty, a new Han Empire. It was a return to the classic Chinese rule, in many people's eyes, a conservative, strong government state, and policies reflected that, in part to counter Japanese piracy 
and in reaction to millions dead from the plague, private foreign trade was criminalized. China had almost always been concerned with national stability rather than conquest, partially because it was such a difficult task to keep each region unified in the first place. But with reduced trade, it grew increasingly isolationist. As was normal throughout history, China, no matter what it was called, was worried about issues within itself more than in the rest of the world. China's diplomacy was very unique, as was its position in the world. In most of the world, international relations were generally placeable on a range of all-out war to peaceful ally. Choose any two countries and you'll usually find their relationships on that spectrum. China could never negotiate or trade with another nation. That would be to admit equality. Instead of trade was the concept of tribute. Some areas we now consider countries were for much of their existence in many ways part of China, or at the very least, deeply connected to China in ways that go beyond what we think of as alliances. They gave huge tributary donations to China, which sometimes offered protections in return or gifts or nothing at all. Gifts were how two-way trade often worked. Offer up a tribute and receive a gift back from the self-declared superior empire. Vietnam, Japan, Korea, Thailand are some examples of formerly tributaries. It's interesting to see how Chinese culture blends in to make significant contributions to each of these countries even today. Most of the time, they weren't formally part of China, but one could be forgiven for thinking that they were. That's how close tributaries could be. China was the father of the tributary nations. That's important to understand. Though the ruling class might have viewed the empire as the most supreme government in the world, it was rife with internal issues. Famine, disease, and tragedy struck an unimaginable number of people in China over the last several thousand years. Throughout most of recorded history, China has been estimated to have experienced an average of one famine per year. Movement of food through the country has always been an issue. Weather, wars, insects, floods, death and suffering has always been with China. And there was an almost unimaginable amount of people. That's the thing. Many people underestimate China's sheer size. In 500 BC, it already had more people than Australia has today. By 400 BC, it had passed the modern population of Canada. Today's British population was surpassed around 750 AD. The border shifted and with it the census areas, but over time China grew to be massive. During some periods, one in every eight people in the world were Chinese. In other periods, that number was more like one in every three. Count up all the romance stories of the past, all the arguments, all the families, and the interactions by people. A large portion of those were Chinese people. Everything humans have experienced has been experienced in China. By 1405, the Ming's navy was larger than all of Europe's navies combined. The enormous navy sailed not for conquest, but for tribute visits and gifting trade. Though many Chinese believed the earth was square-shaped, 28,000 men traveled the seas in a heavily armed military formation. Central Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, China's powerful navy flexed its muscles to all nearby countries. While it did occasionally interfere with local politics or daily life, in seven major voyages, China never sought to colonize. China was worried about China. And maybe it should have stayed that way because a single encounter with a foreign nation set into motion a series of fateful events. These events would eventually lead to the near total destruction of the entire supernation, the end of the empire, and the deaths of countless millions of people. Though this episode seems like the beginning, it's only the background of the story. Next, we will discuss the beginning of the end of China, and then we'll start the real story, its rebirth. Thank you for joining me on this journey. My apologies to those ancient people. I cannot cover their lives in greater detail at this time. We move on, and soon, Epic China will truly begin. Thanks, everybody. See you.